Just a little down. There we go. Okay, you're live. All right. Hitting the record button. So, welcome to our Board of Health meeting on June 14th, 1 p.m., close enough. I know we've all been just dying to get to this point where we can have this meeting. So thanks First for, annual event. <laughs> thanks for coming. The most official one we've, got, we've had to date. Um, when Audrey comes back in, remind me, I've got a bill here. I'm actually working on a computer. All right. Well, it was in the uh, mailbox. I signed off on it. And it's for um, Pete Russell. I'm going to ask her to give us a heads up when that lands in the mailbox because I'm not always checking that. So I don't want anybody to have to wait for their money. All right. So the first item, uh, I figure we probably could look to do. Oh, there you are. Thank you. All wired in with all the heads up. It was um, office space and equipment. I, I wanted to broach that subject because I know the. Um, there's a vacancy now from, I think it's the uh, general assistance out back. And as we move forward, we're probably going to need to consider some office space for files and uh, documents and uh, workspace. So maybe there's a room back there uh, to start our fledgling health department. Um, Lenny, when you met out there for the space stuff, did Everybody kind of decide what they wanted to do, not do, or nobody. I didn't meet there. They didn't meet. Okay. I did. Oh, I thought you said okay. No. We all met. Yeah. Was yeah everybody we all did that. Okay. <clears throat> so has anybody come up with a? Yeah. I layout. Came up with a plan. There's a full layout, and the uh, the shared desk space has been decommissioned. I mean, there's still a shared computer, but we're moving the mat case, which was sort of in the way to where that shared desk was. So there actually isn't a... Um, well, we're gonna be down a desk in the health office or so we may have to look at redoing that. I, I think we're, we're probably, you know, a desk, a file cabinet uh, doesn't have to be huge to start and we possibly would, but might want to consider a computer. Right now, um, yeah. It wouldn't really matter to me. I, we're going to need to be able to lock up some things because it, chances are we're going to have some sensitive material that you don't want everybody to get because, you know, when you get into some of the health stuff, it could impact people. It's just a file cabinet block. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so you can use a joint desk if it's one of the yeah. cabinet blocks. We're, we're obviously not going to be there uh, a lot of the time. It's just when there's a workspace available to you or something like yeah. and file things. Um, um, don't need it immediately, but uh, down the road, I would foresee that perhaps a computer because nothing has ever been collected that I'm aware of for the health department. I know it was a gentleman uh, in the first, uh, first decade of 2000s who was pretty active on keeping up with things, but there were no records. When I came into this as a selectman, uh, there was basically nothing. In fact, the one the one interesting thing I got and I've added to somewhat is the manual, which is from uh, 2006. This is the health officer's manual. They don't even produce this anymore. Uh, it's all little PDFs on the website that you have to download and print. Are you using your desktop out there or did that get moved to shared elsewhere? Or there's a shared computer out there that's kept up to date that is used by the um, the land use boards, myself, um, the supervisor of the checklist. It's a it's it's got a login. It's got a um, you know, a login code for all the individuals that use it. It's an up to date computer hooked into the system, and it will continue to be there. And it's used by everyone who uses the back office space, separate from my laptop which is used for the zoning officer so it is a it is a shared computer it's been in one place it was used by um general assistance when they moved out of there and i met with everybody who was using the back space we talked about everybody's needs and there were people who needed the computer so we're putting it in a place where everyone can access it but nobody needed the desk the, we're, we're, we're pretty full up on desks out there. Um, it was looking nice to decommission a full-size desk, 
um, and we're actually pretty full of one five gallons. And I can understand the need for additional space. But the other thing is that in the last year, um, the trustee of the trust funds has, has moved their file cabinet out there. Um, there are like seven different departments that have their file cabinets out there, along with the supervisors having two desks and my having a desk and the shared computer station. So it's, and, and keeping a quote conference room, which we will probably see more use of now that you've gone back to evening meetings. Um, Vicki, you're not as familiar with it because you're more recently on the board, but with the board of selectmen having evening meetings, if you ever run over, then, you know, um, conservation commission used to meet back there, historic district would meet back there, planning board of education would meet back there because this room would be occupied. So we haven't thought to, to decommission it as a meeting room as well. We are, we are suffering a space crunch. Well, you, usually we schedule in here on the calendar to make sure that the boards uh, are met. So the, I don't know how many people are actually meeting out there anymore. Uh, historic district used to do it when I was on way back. Yeah, they they meet Monday, so we meet in here. Right, right. So they haven't. I know we have a, everybody. We all know we have a space crunch. Uh, but whether that stays a conference room or not, or has to be converted to office space, I guess that's a question for you guys to wrestle with. The computer, like general assistance, I'm just a little concerned with some of the information that we're going to deal with here. That it really doesn't have a full access for anyone. M myself dealing with the email address that we have set up right now in Outlook is just, I don't know if anybody's used Outlook, Chuck, I'm sure you have, it's painful. So getting a, a you know a regular uh, account like a Gmail account would be nice. It's a lot more conducive to responding and receiving information. So that's something I just want you guys to consider. Like I said, we're making do for now, but if we hit stride, um, and I'll get into some of the agencies that we have been in touch with over the last year, that makes it more, um, I think you'll see why there might be a sensitive nature to all this. So anything we can do for securing files and to keeping records on a, you know, a computer and such, something when I'm gone and Dave's gone, can be handed over to the next individuals here who you know are following up with these things. Because as I said before, we have nothing um, when we started out. We don't have any documents uh, to go by. And that'll be part of what we'd be going with the ordinance and stuff. There's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, things should be preserved for down the road, whoever comes in next. And then because of the sensitive nature of some of the things we would likely be uh, keeping track of, you just don't want anybody to be able to access it on the computer. That's my view. So one of the things I'll check into with, with the tech guys, there's a way to set up individual log on as Rebecca said. Yeah. Everybody can, when they log in, they can only see their stuff. Right, right. that's the way it's set up. I couldn't see general assistance. No one can see my login stuff. Um, you know, no one can see the other one. So there can be a completely private yeah. health officer login yeah. for that. And I'm sure we can shoehorn in another file cabinet. Um, the, and, you know, the question is whether they feel like they need a full dedicated desk, which is what general assistance had, which was only used, you know, whatever, as opposed to having a desk, you know, the, the shared computer, which has some additional desk space to it for what you're doing. And then, there, you know, the conference table is actually used by everyone out there as a place to spread out maps or sort of files when you're putting them away and all that kind of stuff. So if it's if it's not a, a full-scale desk desk need, but a file cabinet and a computer access, that can certainly be accommodated. Well, obviously, as we start off, the needs will be uh, minimal and there's a potential for growth and it's just as just go wherever they go in an actual. Yeah, this restricted passport would work to get it going anyway. Yeah. To right. get it going, that's right. right. And then down the road, you know, one of the things I see with land use stuff, planning board and ZBA, those aren't confidential information things. And granted, there's usually some hard copies and things. There's, there's other documents that stay out there to preserve the record. <laughs> Whereas if your, your computer is something where the health department 
that may want to, uh, that may need to stay around long term versus some of the information that's kept by land use boards. That's all I'm trying to say. We might want to preserve some of this. Do you know, is that hooked up to the automatic backup and redundant system? Would that shift computer on the side? I don't know what it's hooked up to. That's I know it is hooked up to the server. I know it's, I know it's one of the places that you can get into, which of course would also be advantageous to use that computer for the health department if in fact they, um, their access includes access to avatar because rather than getting into the public access, Avatar, it gets into the up to date files for Avatar, which is why I use it because when I go on my laptop, it's just public access. Right. That logs on to me and the system. Yeah. And the system? Yeah, that, yeah that's, yeah. Not, that's so, not what the general public gets. That's I understand what, I mean. what my general question is yep. there's the backup, there's redundant backup, and then there's the cloud. And everything we have on all of the office computers is supposed to be set up that when you're dealing on the computer and you're plugged into this system, it's being backed up in three locations. I believe that is because I believe- I just, I'm just gonna make a note of us. I think it is because yeah. it was originally talked about. I just want to verify that. Right. And we'll just pull it. So I'll, I'll take that to do it. Because I know there's been some lapses in capturing data. So. But anyway, I, I'm not gonna just stay on this too long. Everybody's got the gist of it. <clears throat> As time allows, we go forward, we can see what we can do. Um, I think everybody has a, a reasonable expectation of what it would take to keep documents. So, um, so with that, uh, I've reached out to um, DHHS officials, actually, Sophia Johnson, about seeing if the state would uh, pony up for um, a, uh, a health training. Uh, years ago, and I have the information from May 2016, where um, Christine Fillmore did uh, health training back then. And I have the, the training material, but we don't have, it's, it's not everything. It just kind of uh, summarizes what she goes through. And it covers a lot of areas because it goes into authority um, on entering properties, the legal uh, RSAs that cover most of the nuisances, um, kind of uh, bottom line to, uh, opinions on process. There's a lot of RSAs that uh, we touch on uh, different um, statutes for sure. And um, involved with- so Is she developing something? Well, she, and that's what I asked if, if she could update it because Christine had this whole presentation before when she was back with uh, um, Gardner Fulton and Wah. And she's now with Drummond Woodson, and I think you guys just attended yeah, a training. Unfortunately, training she didn't want to call it right, and she's really a great presenter. So that's why I reached out to uh, Sophia to see about this because there's just so many things in dealing with a vi violations, preserving records. Um, there's steps you have to take; otherwise, whatever you do is going to be null and void and thrown out. And it's not an easy understanding to to process um, a site. It's it really it's a, it's a lot more detailed than, than you would think. Certainly a lot more detailed than I thought of originally. So I think most health officers probably wouldn't know exactly the do's and don'ts in, in if you have to prosecute a situation or just what you're allowed to do or not to do. So um, Sophia's uh, heard from some other people who were looking for a training like this. So we'll see if that comes about. But it was just outreach to. So at this point, she's looking into it. Nothing mm -hmm. formally. Needed. Nothing formally. How are your copies of that? Yeah. Um, well, this. Um, I'd rather have it on the website rather than that. Well, I'll give you this. I made a copy of what I have so that you can kind of get a, an idea of what. Um, I thought was relevant in, in asking for this. You know, you kind of get the idea that there's a lot of pitfalls that you can step into when you <clears throat> deal with situations like this. There's, uh, you know, immunities and there's liabilities and what you can do, what you can't do, what you may want to do just so that you don't find yourself doing a he said, she said kind of thing. And that's why administrative warrants are a key. Um, applying for those, it's, it's, it's not straightforward to just go on a property. When you have to follow up with Audrey, make sure she scans those things. She knows me all that email out to us. Yeah, all of us like a copy. Yeah. 
So it just kind of sets a baseline for some of the training I'm looking for for Dave, myself, and others. So, uh, let's see. The next thing I wanted to cover was some of the basic roles of, of the health officer, what we cover, because it's not just simply septic systems, and that's what's going to lead to some of um, the ordinance changes that we've been kind of discussing for the last few years. So um, public health issues can involve, involve uh, like just adults and children, whether they're in crisis or there's abuse. So there's a lot of uh, contact information for abuse. Um, so role of the health officer, knowing the signs of abuse and neglect, reporting uh, the same, gathering evidence, uh, limits of your authority, um, unsanitary conditions is only a, a part of this. Uh, notifying property owners and landlords of unsanitary conditions related to self-neglect. Um, try to correct some of these things uh, to protect the public health in your community. Um, enforcement, uh, not just with the state and local codes, but uh, some tend to have to involve law enforcement, sheriff's department, or local law enforcement. And then uh, and, uh, there's the, the law, laws and regulations around all of that. There's uh, adult protective services, child protection acts. So there's quite a bit of things that we would be uh, in, involved with potentially. Um, there's uh, hoarding and unsanitary conditions are just uh, two of the things that go along with a, a great long list of self-neglect items, uh, signs of abuse and neglect are covered. So this is just one of the little things that is, is uh, captured in there. You know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and of course, uh, frequently asked questions. So these will be hopefully more trainings that will come about. Um, I'll skim through that and I'll just tell you just another one of the flyers that uh, these were put out by DHHS, by the way, so they're easy, readily accessible. The role of the um, health officer in uh, regards to septic systems, there's also the um, housing standards, which is RSA 48A. So it addresses rental uh, and public housing, and it goes into the requirements there. And then RSA 147, which covers a wide variety of, of things, primarily to the whole code. And one of the things I'll probably touch on later is uh, RSA 147.8. This is a very broad, RSA, but I think it really conveys that the requirements are that all occupied buildings must have readily accessible toilet facilities which are in proper sanitary condition with suitable drains or sewers for conveying wastewater and sewage away from premises. These are applied to both all occupied buildings, including residential and commercial buildings. So the state really kind of goes into a deeper language in that RSA on what this applies to. So it isn't just, you know, the, the single homeowner septic system. So the research you've done with the surrounding town and local New Hampshire laws with some of the health officers out there and some of the ordinances that they've got, do we have to be able to get anything that uh, we could use at the beginning of a model? Um, we have to tweak it like we need anyone? Right. And um, I have that kind of further down on our revisions, but, but I, I will say that I have some uh, base material that I'll, I'll kind of give you an overview of to, to go just where you're, you're going. And my next step is to, uh, again, reach out to Sophia Johnson at Health to see if there's any new information or town ordinances that they're, you know, looking at that they think are really, you know, you get a lot of good uh, material from them. But that is part of the ongoing process. Um, so part of this role of the health officers is, is uh, doing inspections, obviously. So you've got to notify owners of your activity, um, tend to do things in advance. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of just going on to properties unannounced, which is something you can do. But uh, I think it's a, a lot easier to deal with people if they have a forewarned that you're coming 
try to make sure nobody's caught by surprise. And then to document and your log and your visits, um, develop a site sketch, uh, carry legal identification. And there's just more, 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 and more of these, these things to be discussed. And it's looking at privies and sewerage and how that uh, equates in the state's role versus the town's local audience. Uh, ordinances, sorry, and uh, covers privies and porta parties. So there's considerable amount of information that can be found on the state's website, and they're all PDFs. There's four pages of PDFs on the website that they'll bring you to. Um, and again, I think anybody on the board probably wouldn't hurt to become familiar with uh, RSA 147.8 because it really does outline the requirements that every building has. And it's really like the first paragraph of the page, the first third of the page really outlines where, where you kind of find ourselves when we deal with anybody's property. And um, these are the state states laws requirements so, and I have a copy here that I have and Chuck I guess you, you want to have that made copies I've underlined the really key uh, pieces of it. I'm going to say there's probably roughly 10 a page maybe the fourth page as eight so you you know somewhere 30 plus I would say PDFs that's why I didn't download them all yet. And they don't have anything comprehensive in a manual from the state because it's too big for their, they're allowed a certain amount of information that they can send out or receive and it's limited for whatever reason. So that's why they don't have a PDF uh, manual there because it's just their service won't process it. Um, the next thing I will uh, leave you with, and again, this is another item I did a bit of a mock-up on, and this was just um, from an online search, and it's not put out by the state or anything, but it was just a Google search for uh, basically diseases that are and pathogens and such that are a byproduct of human waste. So. There's 15 items here, and some of them you've heard of, some of them you probably haven't. Some of them are probably not much worse than getting the flu. Um, a lot of them are much more serious and potentially uh, can cause death. And most of them are pretty communicable. So even though on your property, you're comfortable with living the way you are, and maybe there's human waste being dispensed without in the backyard because you don't have a good septic system or a septic system, the pathogens that you can adopt into your own body gets you sick. You run up to Hannaford's, there's no telling how many people you can now infect. It's a lot of these things are extremely contagious. And I'll just, um, um, well, probably worse. Um, encephalitis is one, for instance, um, hepatitis A, uh, typhoid. So, you know, again, uh, shingles, uh, shingleosis is on here. Um, so there's a, there's a number of things. And again, I, I did a mock up here, but I'll give you a blank one so that just for whatever reasons anybody cares, you know, that's just informational. Uh, this was not put out by the state and, and I won't guarantee just how great the information is. I did pull it from Google, but it, it seems consistent in some things I've seen. You heard the outcome of the dam, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> such an event. And, and, and yeah, and some of that uh, was well, kind of, nothing. nothing was done. If you wait long enough, I waited long enough, which is what we tested did. it and said, oh, there's nothing here. So we just flushed it down the middle, right down into everybody's drinking. <laughs> so yeah, I'm uh, well, that's what we discussed when we were there, right? It's on its way to Maine and it'll be out to sea before you know it. So, um, and I'll cover some of, of those interactions and complaints and stuff later, and that'll be one of them. So, um, another thing that we do, and, and that is we receive approvals for um, 
operation or construction of, of uh, ISDSs, which is an individual septic disposal system. And we'll get um, notices occasionally that applications have been put in. So I've got roughly uh, 20 or so from the last year. And now we're approving them. I print them out, I keep a copy, I go through them. And I've even had only, well, I've only had one occasion to reach out to a designer to tell them a minor uh, error on the page because that um, it was just a uh, map and lot was incorrect. So the gentleman did a correction and submitted that back. Uh, what I'm not seeing is the actual septic designs in most cases. So those though are on a website now with the state. So you should be able to take these ID numbers and go in and pull up a lot of information years past. I think it was in 2005 or earlier. You, it's, you don't get the, the big dump of information. Now there's like a back pages you can go into to get a lot of information. General information you would get is who designed it, who installed it, the, base, the owner at the time. Um, some of the address material kind of gets lost if it's a lot by lot, uh, map and lot number. As Lenny, I'm sure you know, we, we had a change back in I think around 0304, maybe it's 04 from the map and lot stuff. So things that are older may say, you know, map eight, and we don't have map eight anymore. So you get a cross reference. I did um, reach out at one point to Cardio Graphics, and they did have some kind of a download. It really wasn't making a lot of sense to me. They sent me it, but it doesn't. It's not straightforward that the uh, to reproduce the maps because there are those old maps, and it wouldn't be bad to get. I think Rebecca was chasing them at one point in time, and they I have. have them. I have. I have a two thousand and two and a two thousand and four. And the 1978, I've had a bunch of early ones. I also have a web provided for me, which is the cross check for converting the old map and lot number to new okay. or new to old. So there's binders out there that have that information where you can do the, do the cross reference. I checked, was it David or was it someone else? Maybe it was Chris that was looking for it, and I actually emailed Gwen at home, and she said, no, she didn't have that in the digital format. All we had was the binders. But we do have the binders out there cross-referenced in a couple of different couple of different ways. And one of the things that needs to actually happen out there is a, is the acquisition of a bookcase for shared stuff like that, all the land use books, uh, the cross-referencing for maps, stuff like that. Because at this point we have bookends here, there, and elsewhere, and it's not really clear um, you know, how many copies of a road not taken. A roadless travel, whatever it is, a roadless travel, travel. travel. Our roadless travel, thank you, Robert Frost, I mean, um, but a uh, yeah, centralized bookcase that, where all the, the shared reference material would be available would, would make it easier for everyone. And if we've only got the one copy, I'd probably look to make a second copy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just... Rebecca, are they basically like <clears throat> different pages? Or yeah. are they pretty much the same size? The pages, yeah. right? The, the cross-referencing book? Yeah, it's I mean, fold out pages or anything? Or no, it's just... a binder. You could just, uh, I, if I remember, memory serves me correctly, it's in there with the the, uh, the binders on the HUD standards for mobile homes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Useful reference materials. Um, yeah. The maps are in the map books, and they're right there. They're labeled. Um, you know, the, the current map is on my, my secondary desk. But if you look in the map case, it says, you know, which, which years the older maps are from. The, the cross, cross referencing is really the one that I would but you know, most like to, to come and grab a book and make your own copy of it. You know, from well, the, time the, the reason I'm asking the question, we have a son of a we have a son of a binder. Did you have to make a digital copy of each one of them? Yeah, we, that we've got them. Oh, okay, send them up to be scanned, yeah. That'd be fine. I mean, I could certainly leave that one for a week or two. Well, I'd make a copy before you send them out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it's two binders. I think it's done old to new and new to old. There may also be one property owner or whatever, but that's by now probably pretty useless. Yeah, that's by property owners. Just, yeah, not, doesn't stay relevant as properties turn out. Um, so, uh, that's part of what we do is we, we look at some of these subsurface systems and, and uh, try to stay up on that. A lot of them 
take a number of years before they actually go into operational approval because there's a three to four years that they window before people have to build them and before the plan has to be resubmitted. But we're uh, trying to keep up with that and that's part of a catalog we'd like to start is to especially capture the ones that have <coughs> completely gone through to an operational approval and we know that they're, they're up and running. Um, so public complaints and inquiries are another uh, area where I've seen a lot of activity. Um, recently, there was some work done in one of our businesses um, in town and some buzz was on that. So we followed up looking at that and everything was fine. But we've gotten the um, uh, calls for adult protective services and um, the occasional, uh, what's my neighbor doing? Do they have all the permits? So, as we all know, we, we know about the waste drum that was out on the property uh, last year on the side of the road. Uh, as Lenny touched on, it was what looked to be pretty, pretty comfortable. There was chemical toilet um, agent that was dumped at the Ossipy Dam. Um, in fact, I did take some pictures to uh, blow up in here. I think I used I know uh, Vicky and Chuck, you guys may not have been made it out to the scene. You so, made it to that time. Well, I got pictures too. Oh, yeah. did you? You went, okay. Yeah. I, you probably were there before. You don't want to see shit? <laughs> well, just, just to, you know, I have multiple pictures, but, you know, as a matter of for people to see, it's a record that I believe is a chemical agent because there was no pollen on the shores. Lenny and I went to the other dam the bigger section of the dam. There's no pollen over there. And uh, when you blow this up, we're certainly on the computer. And everybody recognizes the smell. Well, and there was that, but a picture doesn't give you that unless you get the scratch. No, because it was pollen sitting on top of it. Yeah, it was it was pretty pungent. I'll give I'll give you that. <laughs> By the end of the week though, there was pollen coming down the river pretty good. Oh yeah. Fine when I find it. But like yeah, it, you could smell the chemical. Yeah. That day. I'm I, I'm I'm pretty sure that you're comfortable that that was not Paul in that day. <laughs> so so you know again, but here here again, um, some of the things that might cause a 55 gallon drum uh, to be on the side of the road uh, full of human waste. Um, you know where where is that coming from? Not likely from somebody who has an actually functioning septic system. And again. Uh, I, I can't say where the material that went into Osprey Lake absolutely came from, but it's my an ongoing concern of mine as to how waste is being dealt with with the RVs in town because those are we're seeing more and more of those RVs coming to town, and um, that's again will be a later conversation or further. That barrel you mentioned there was that the one that was in the state forest. Yeah, talking about this is. Uh, yeah. picture right into a, <clears throat> the you know seasonal or, or that ended up not being human waste. Uh, I thought one of them was and the other was yeah. apple. No, just with that apple ranch or whatever it was. It was both. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well that's at least good news. Yeah. Apple mash. Yeah. Somebody making blue was it was pretty putrid. Yeah, it was smelly. Okay, well, that's good to know. So at least that's one. Uh, I'll, I'll take off my list of concerns, but it's what we will call to, to uh, go see. And I think they treated it as human waste originally. So when it, that was hauled away from Clean Harbors, came with a pretty hefty price tag, I think more than a thousand dollars. Yeah, it was going to be a little hundred. But the state came and tested it. Said no, it wasn't human waste. Okay. And told the fire department when that. Nice. And empty it out and put it air out and put the barrel away to the transfer station. Well, at least uh, that's one <clears> down. <throat> um, I do have a credible report from uh, another uh, state health agency. Um, a woman told me that she was on a property for performing her duties and um, is absolutely certain she saw her. Uh, Toilet paper, human waste, and understands that the practice on uh, the property is to uh, utilize a five gallon bucket and then uh, dump it on the property. So uh, that's another property that has a recreational vehicle, small trailer. Yeah. 
So anyway, um, but we've had calls uh, for living conditions on commercial units. Um, a different uh, entity uh, was uh, called for a mold, which didn't really seem to be um, anything actionable other than you know maybe a little bit of uh, cleaning and, and ventilation because of the situation there. But I mean, everybody's been very cooperative. Um, I did have a a, um, a property owner, a landlord call me about bed bugs being caused by a renter. So, you know, how do you deal with renters that cause problems like this? And um, so there's some reference material and, and such was the best I was able to help him with because um, I just haven't been around long enough and dealt with enough of these situations. Yes, Becca. Brings up a good point because I was talking to JT about um, needing to do a rental inspection and he was going, I have no idea. There's no information out there. No one uh, told him it was part of his job. So it's sort of a sidebar because if in fact rental properties are displaying health issues, then maybe the um, the yearly inspection that the town is requiring of rental properties but has not set a uh, requirement uh, for uh, the health hasn't hasn't. Doesn't have a form, I guess right. is the way I could put it. I think Randy used to go out um, and look at it and check for a couple of things and then come back, but it was not a formal process. Um, and I told JT when I was, I was talking to him about actually the adult services issue, but I said, have you managed to get out to Champion Hill yet, where he was uh, a rental inspection meeting? And he said, he said, basically, we need some kind of system because I've, I've never done this before. So maybe, you know, maybe I was, I was actually going to bring it up tonight at the Board of Cycling meeting, but bring it up right now and say that somehow we can coordinate um, David and me looking to see if we can find anything that lists the rental properties through the database and then provide them to the Board of Selectment and the Board of Health to create some kind of system for Can you more. identify commercial? Well, they're not listed as commercial. Non residential, but mm -hmm. a lot of them would still be showing as residential. Yeah, yeah. If they're not considered non residential unless they're multi family. If they're just, if it's just a single property or even a two family rental, it's it's not flagged in any way. So I think it's everyone putting their heads together to identify the ones that we know of and and using that. You know, there may only be half a dozen, but using that as a way to create a process and then we can just add to that list as they, as they show up. But it seems like maybe um, the, the yearly inspection should be a combination of fire safety and health. Yeah. It doesn't have to be done at the same time, but you can have a, a shared checklist or whatever that, uh, that lets everybody know that both departments have gone out and that everything is okay. Yeah, well, I was good. Sure. Randy. He must have had some form or something that he followed. Well, he may have. It just didn't come back to my department because it wasn't part of zoning. <clears throat> so I, I remember one instance that Randy got called about an electrical outlet. Yeah, the, he went to the up above the antique shop here and, down the road. And I remember him going to that. But because I had been called by the uh, the owner or the tenant, you know, I got caught in the middle of it, cycling photographs through and everything, but it was actually, you know, I was only part of it because I sort of got caught by the property owner about a complaint by one of the tenants. I, I, I can't, that was the, it was the daughter of, of a tenant. It, it was very, very complicated and it really didn't have anything to do with zoning. Uh, but, but, but I'd gotten cut into the, into the circuit because again, you know, as, as we know, um, you know, the, the fire, the fire chief and the fire department as a as a rental inspection agent isn't really listed anywhere on the on the town website. Um, and at that time, neither was a health officer. Um, so a, a property owner who was concerned about how a rental property was being dealt with would only have two options to either call the town administrator or call me. And Often they just do both or or email me um, because there wasn't a there wasn't a central collecting point for rental properties. And we you know we even have all those ADUs that go in now um, where it stays quite clearly on the ADU checklist and getting an ADU if you want to convert your ADU to a rental property, which you are allowed to do, it's subject to the inspections of rental properties. But 
we don't have any way of we're not we don't have any systems of tracking that because once once it's approved through zoning how it's used is do you know if there's any module in the agriculture system that would be okay to add in rentals just flagging different building rentals. okay so mm -hmm. gives you value for the property you can tell it how many units that's it so um as far as uh health ordinance and inspections uh i don't i can look into rental units and you know the the more as we would normally call them commercial facilities and, and that those might be something for us otherwise there's some um, oh like um, high watch that's a state license thing and they do the state performance inspections there versus the health officer but life safety is Randy. Well, Randy did the inspections at, uh, at Ottawa. Right, he does life safety on those and anything else. So I would imagine, since life safety is all part of the NIMS training programs, they probably have some basic uh, standardized documents, forms that they would use. I think that's a very structured environment, so that probably exists. And JT could probably reach out to most anybody in that field to get those. I think. I will research to what um, what our potential is here for inspections uh, from the health officer's standpoint. Most of the time, uh, I what I see being discussed is we're more or less a complaint driven at the small municipality level. You know, somebody complains about a living condition or whatever, or a tenant. That's when we tend to have our involvement bigger cities like uh, Concord or something, they do restaurant inspections where we wouldn't uh, have that authority in this town. So there's there's some <clears throat> educating on my part I have to, to look into to, to understand what kind of uh, role we could play in, in inspections for that place. So I'll follow us, that's a good, good point. Uh, and uh, part of what we do do inspections on and have done was uh, the school did an inspection there uh, we get called in to do foster care property reporting going and make sure a property is uh, conducive for you know somebody to adopt uh, or foster taking people for foster care now we don't have a formal form for that but that is uh, covered by the state and we just haven't had a recent one so i haven't done that yet that's, a, that's a thing that's also done by home inspectors that are then specifically uh, certified for doing that. And it's also done by property management companies that send their people out with a checklist for the state before uh, uh, people can move in, you know, or foster kids can move in. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful at all, or if, you know, my guess is you should probably have a checklist, huh? right? Right. You can have such a checklist by the sound. Uh, I might, I might be able to. <clears throat> and the, and the state does um, have material on that. So uh, the daycare they provided a, a forms for that, so we can follow up, and that's part of what we've got coming up with the ordinance. Uh, things we'll be talking about shortly will be those documents and the need to kind of produce our own. The one inspection I did for a foster family, um, the family had a form from the state uh, and I had to fill it in. So that, right. And so I do know that state <laughs> does provide things. Sometimes those are template <clears throat> forms, um, which are great. And in, in being templated, sometimes it leaves for room for expansion. I don't know what I don't know, so I'm not sure that we would have to need to expand on anything. I'm just like the daycare, just as Playland up there. She yeah. had her own form from the state. She yeah, said they check it out. Fill it out. She had one waiting for me, but I had brought my own because they were just downloads too. So, and, and there's, oh. there's adult. I don't know if we have any adult daycares in town. I know Campbell has has a couple of adult daycares, and I know at one point we had. Um, someone who was uh, who was running um, in-house, uh, uh, not uh, not adult daycare, but what you call granny care, 
um, and there wasn't anything anywhere in our zoning ordinance that um, that prohibited someone from renting three rooms in their house to aged ladies that they were looking after. But that would certainly be something that would flag right. the health officer in that kind of situation, um, even if even if it wasn't a, a, a zoning issue. It would be um, like daycare or adult daycare. It would be. I'm not sure what you call it, senior. It wasn't senior housing because she was living there. It was um, it was like it was like foster. It was like being a foster parent, only it was like being a foster child. You were bringing in grandparents and fostering them. In the, in, if, if you see my analogy, I, I know of one situation in town where uh, a woman used to perform that uh, services for adults care. Uh, as part of her job and facility, and has some uh, adults that she cares for. Has some grannies at home. Well, some some young adults are, you know, yeah. they're probably middle age potentially now, uh, whatever that is these days. So um, it really wasn't something I had really considered until you just mentioned it. Um, I know the state, though, in that particular case, funds it. So it isn't like you sent your own, you know, relative there. It is. This, there is a state involvement, which makes me think that that's probably in a reasonably good shape because the state does inspect it's that. It's a licensed independent living right. facility as opposed to someone who just thinks because they're looking after their own grandmother, they can, they can manage to look after a couple more. Right. So that's, a, that's an interesting point, again, to look into. Um, as Lenny had stated with the uh, daycare on Green Mountain Road, that I believe is an annual, um, not an annual, biannual yeah. inspection. Yeah. So um, I know <laughs> we expected that. And uh, it's to the best of my knowledge, from the records that I have of my own being doing this job for a couple of years now, that's the only licensed daycare in the town. And I'm not aware of any other facility taking in adults or anyone else. I watch you still own a property on Larfield. I mean, is it was it was it not was it over the line into Ossipy? Because I know when when my husband worked at High Watch, he he attended some semi-independent living um, brain damage folks that were in the apartment complex on High Watch. Um, as you go down on on uh, Ryefield, you go down Ryefield from Green Mountain Road, and you pass the big open red barn way in the back there and you go a little bit further and there's a driveway in and there's an apartment complex in there. I'm pretty sure that's in our town and it was a yeah and it was a it was a it was a it was a, it was a multi unit facility that Lakeview put on um, slightly independent living people that were part of their uh traumatic brain injury program. Well, and most of the people that lived there they built them mostly for their help. Most of the clients, they call them. Yeah. Most of the clients stayed right on campus. Yeah. Well, it seems to me we need to find out from these big places so what exactly they have in our town. Well, the, the gentleman that owns Ryefield Apartments <clears throat> bought it a number of years ago now. Um, Did he buy it from Hot from Lake? Uh, was it? Was well, it, it, Lake or it, from it was a place in Wolfboro that had apartments there for sale. Yeah. But Brennan was the, the person that started high and built, was, the, uh, built the apartments. Right. Like, he, he built the barn. He was buying everything around. So well, their apartments, whether they were owned by, Lake, they were owned by someone else, they were apartments <clears throat> that were. were uh, well, I think houses. there's a place what you kind of explaining was it's on 153 heading to North Conway, right after the Effingham Falls on the right. Lakeview used to have that's yeah well they had a whole bunch yeah, of yeah, and they had one up in center ross they had, up by the, they still the do school have a whole right bunch of, they had so, a whole bunch of independent living right. facilities but you know it, was, it, it, it changed a whole lot when it was a when it was a brain injury place with with um but i don't know what they are now brain injury care to drug and alcohol rehab the, the behaviors in those houses would have also have changed. I, I don't know how many. But when they first built Wrightfield Apartments, it was mostly for their health. Yeah. So I I have had discussions with the gentleman who owns Wrightfield Apartments, and uh, 
he's been pretty good in, in conversations with me over the years. And uh, I don't know who the clientele is rent, you know, there, but I not I don't think it's from um, Green Mountain Treatment Center. At least when they were late, you know, maybe they had people, but I'm not sure that that exists anymore. I think the change of that business probably negated that need. I do know that on High Watch down from the main facility, there is another facility, but it is not uh, a facility that is, um, you know, run off insurance and all part of that. So it's more of an independent thing. The state isn't licensing and regulating for that one. Now, um, we've, we've gone there for, uh, you know, to speak with those folks. So we're, we're aware of the place. Um, I don't know of anything else in the Ryefield Apartments that's being used for anything other than just the regular apartments. Uh, so uh, again, I, uh, outside of the one facility, like I said, up by Lakeview, where the, it's, it's still part of the, the business, but it's a standalone yeah, kind of entity. Kind of yeah, and I don't know, um, I think they might've changed it to Freedom House, but yeah, we old America. Um, so I, I, I don't know that there's a role for us to play there, except um, should inspections, you know, be deemed appropriate for a facility like that at the ground, on our level, because we don't do the main building. And uh, what, what if any other facilities are around? So I, I will look into whether we have a need to be doing some other, something more in the yard. Dave? Somebody mentioned the daycare facility on Green Mountain Road. Yes. Where is it? It's at the uh, corner of Winter Road. Road. Day Day I think it's listed as a residential house. It is. it is. Yeah. Well, we they, don't do those as residential houses. That's the commercial use of the building. And if it's a licensed daycare, you get a whole new rate. That's the way life works. And I'm the guy that created that. Well, I can't speak to the assessing portion. That is your area. I know Rebecca knows that there's been that business was established and it's long standing, been approved. There was issues came in and it was questioned before. I think that the planning board, which of course is different from decisions assessing rates, but the planning board decided that um, in our zoning ordinance that the home, the daycare facilities were considered a, um, a home use um, and, and did not require review by the planning board, unlike um, cottage industries and home occupations, the daycare now, I'm not sure whether it came down on that because my feeling on that was it wasn't cottage industry because it, it, it spills out in the yard, it's very visible, it's a lot of traffic and stuff. Well, so, and that's that's to go back to the planning board. I honestly think that you know, the, 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 and this is not completely relevant to this, but the, um, the daycare, the cottage industry, the home occupation, we've got all these different categories and different checklists, and, and quite honestly, I don't think it's fair to the people in the community. Um, for them to not understand whether we're talking about whether something is a use that's associated with residential use or whether it's being considered, as David might, a non-residential use. Um, so I think that, you know, having David perhaps provide some input the next time we work on the zoning ordinance and get some clarification on those different... Topics. I had the whole state change because I was the assessor in Rochester. And they had call them cottage industries. Our cottage industries with 60 kids. But, you know, so I put them all as daycare. They weren't houses anymore. They were daycare facilities. And their assessments were up there. But as I saw, sat and thought, the church has one, that church has one, that church has one. I went and taxed them all. And we went all the way to Supreme Court and I said, you know what? Seven, eight hours of religion a day for those kids. It's not a church. It doesn't fall under your religious exemption. And it's not a school? It's, well, it uh, doesn't fall no. under a school. Well, They're well, not teaching or guys, qualifying. Guys, for the sake of this meeting, though, yeah. I don't think that's our discussion right, point. But no, the we want to make sure that when we look at this, right? <clears throat> I thought it JJ, but I didn't get a good look at it when I was up there. I was doing the property next door. And I'm going, 
but it was nighttime, so there weren't a lot of kids out there going, it looks like it so, could be a daycare. Well, so you have to think of these things because it influences others. Well, okay. uh, well from your assessing point, that, I'm going to just go beyond that here because that's not what we're here to focus on in this particular meeting. I know it's an established daycare that has been before boards and it's all up and up within the town for it to operate. I know it has a current license and it's licensed for, I believe, 17 kids. So there aren't 60, but it is what it is. And as I was just trying to make the point, as far as the, the town in, in allowing this business to be there, it's legitimate and is uh, being recognized by the state and being inspected by the health officer. Lenny's been there before myself. It's all it's all by the numbers, and that's the it's only the one that I'm aware of. But right. if they're operating with a state license to be a daycare, they automatically become a commercial business. Well, again, yeah, that's yeah. that's not for the, the discussion of the order of health. Yeah. I can no, appreciate that. Right. They, 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 they have to be inspected by the board of health. The, yeah. Right. Thing. Does um, the state give you a get something? A couple of. Uh, can we focus back on board of health stuff? Well, any sort of questions? As part of that, every year you'd have to inspect it as the board of health. Yep. Bang. Not just to inspect all those you have to. Yep. Every Whether they, you're calling it a cottage industry, if it's the life and safety of children at that facility and they have a state license, you have to. Inspect. But that's what we said. We, we have inspected so it. I didn't it is on the body. And... From that, but <laughs> I'll have to look. So Lenny, I'm sorry, where's your, your question? In town, we've got a couple places that um, house special needs people. Yes. And we don't inspect them. I know the state is, they're probably licensed by the state. But... And and that's, uh, I, I, again, I'm aware of one, and I am aware that the state um, inspects it. And, I mean, I just wondered why that wouldn't fall under it. So it, uh, I'll find, yeah, too. that's where I was going pretty much with the foster care thing, too. I see these people, foster care people reach out to different organizations to get their inspections done. I'm not sure how much of this is our case. From the state's perspective, we are the ones who do foster care inspections. Um, maybe there's a third party component, but what I understand, you know what it is, it's probably because most of the towns don't have operating health boards. But, but well, that's obviously changed by statute now. But I know I've seen a lot of information. One of the recent emails that I've just seen addresses foster care, and it's a, it's a subject matter that keeps coming around. So it is, and it is something covered by the state and the PDFs. So it is ours in this town. We own that one. And um, special needs, I'll look into that, Lenny, um, now that you, you, we've touched on it. And um, I do know with the state inspecting the one facility that I'm aware of, uh, it could be simply being like the, um, the big, you know, Green Mountain Treatment Center. But then again, it's on a smaller scale. If we're inspecting daycares that are licensed, you know, or the school, mm -hmm. so it begs the question. So I will, I will reach out to state and ask that question. Um, so let's see. Uh, I've got a lot of notices on um, public wells. Uh, oftentimes, there is some issue with public wells that. I think for the most are just kind of minor alerts, but we do get noticed on those. It's not typically actionable for us. And there's one facility that um, they, they had some issues and the state came in and, and it has to do with the whole design of the water system. It's so much to it, I wouldn't know where to start. So I just see this ongoing correspondence for over a year now that the state is working with the property owner. So it's, we get noticed on that and should a property change hands um, like Boyle's Market, then we were consulted to make sure that the new owners got the updated information on the wells. So there's small little things that we, you know, land on us to do. Not, not that there was a major concern at all. Um, RVs uh, units occasionally what I'm, I'm getting from complaints is uh, being used as permanent residents. I've got a number of complaints about that. 
Um, multiple RVs, you know, on properties get complaints about that. Um, we have uh, legal actions that are you, you, the board's involved with, with uh, junkyards. And uh, sometimes this overlaps with septic systems. And I think there's a couple of, there's at least one property I can think of that may run that we haven't touched on yet because we, we haven't really gone full bore out there to say what we want to do, what we're going to tackle. Um, the people who are living on that particular property, I think, moved away. So the concerns of the septic may not be as germane as it once was. And they had a family living there. And the reports were there was no septic system. But uh, I know there are other houses that didn't get septic systems. Um, one instance, I know they applied for a plan, got a plan, but it was never installed. Um, the reason I stumbled onto that was because defecation was taking place over the property line, and the property line was rather close. And the uh, property owner of a woodlot, lodge woodlot came up and discovered that. And uh, so subsequently followed up and, and found out what I just told you. So there's some concerns there that if we decide to go forward on dealing with some of these things, there are a few properties that we're going to find that have families living there and they don't meet the state statutes and they don't meet our ordinance. Um, so it'll be kind of where do you want to go with some of this stuff? Yeah. Let's see. Obviously, we've had court appearances um, and the data collection that I'll get into in a bit here for health ordinances. We've um, had uh, calls from visiting nurses, appellate professor, protective services, and um, a lot of emails back and forth with various state agencies. So I got a whole host of those that I have here that uh, communications that we get either from the state for certain things or communications to ongoing issues. Question is that they help us out to try and understand since we're new at this. Um, are we are asking the right questions? Are we looking at the right things? So that's a lot of what transpires behind the scenes is chasing down some of those, those issues uh, and getting a better handle on understanding them. Uh, let's see. So um, let's see. Ordinance revisions is kind of the next thing as uh, Chuck was talking about. There's a number of RSAs, uh, RSA 48 housing standards, 128, which is some of the statutes surrounding uh, the, the health officer uh, authorized investigations. 147, pretty much that whole, all of 147 is, is health related health officer stuff. Um, you get into um, water, 485A and C, those sets of statutes, there's portions of those that would apply. And there, uh, 149M is another crossover, which is something we'd have the authority to run your transfer stations under. So there might be little bits and, bits and pieces that might be something you'd steal from that section. And uh, 147C, as I'm flipping through, I missed that one. Uh, so these are a lot of the statutes that will try to incorporate parts and pieces of them in the new ordinance when we do an update because we want to specify that we have that authority and we want to probably let people know that there's certain expectations that these RSAs would can bed. Um, and then from there is a fair amount of information that Chuck had been asking about that comes either from the state or from other municipalities. There are a number of towns that have some ordinances on health. Now, going through them, a North Conway said, we're not going to be adopting all kinds of things that North Conway does with all its commerce, commercial activities. We scale that down considerably. But there's uh, a handful of towns, six or eight towns that I've pulled together that are going to have some information that we might want to take parts and pieces thereof uh, to craft an ordinance. So what I was going to suggest is that, you know, Dave and I can start working on trying to update the existing, incorporate some of these newer references and um, put together another separate thing of what we might want to say, should we incorporate these items 
and then have a meeting all together and get some information out for you guys to review and then sit down again and see, you know, where we want to put the line. Um, some things are pretty easy because, you know, certain standards are state standards and they're really not supposed to be negotiable. And we just don't list those now, uh, like the housing standard. Not that we incorporate all of the housing standards in RSA 48, but there are touchstones that if you don't have codes in code enforcement, there's certain things that now fall to the health officer as a minimum standard. So most of 48A is not going to be for us. It would be if we had a full staffing, but there are some minimums. So, um, and then of course, documents is contact information stuff. There's tons of that for everybody under the sun that has a shared uh, role, but there's a lot of um, state stuff that uh, again, will look towards templating material for documents. So when you do an inspection or go on site or, you know, to, to document a process, we'll be looking to try and put some of that stuff together. All in all, it's a pretty big lift from where we are at the moment. Any possible questions out there? Vicki, you look excited. You, you've got a list going. My, go on. You know, I know my mind is boggled. <laughs> um, how long do you take to come to the draft? Uh, it could. It could. I'm just want to. I mean, before we know it. Oh, I know. The here, time. Get stuff in and get ready for yeah. town meeting. It's like. Um, I'll I'll try to give it uh, as much as attention as I can. Um, something that I'll probably touch on uh, if I can make it back to your meeting later for the selectmen's meeting is. Um, hazard mitigation and stuff that landed on, you know, from Chris Fournier mm -hmm. for the Talbots and um, not seeing the 14 page, uh, fill this out in, in triplicate. And I say in triplicate because part of what you do when you say, here's our mitigation plan for the culvert we want to fix, they say, and give us two alternative plans and the narratives that they want, uh, several different narratives are, it's going to be no um i'm hoping at least for the grant process i'm in i get some examples <laughs> well it's it, it, it is a tremendous amount of very technical information that's required and a lot of writing to kind of justify where you're going with this and then like i said you basically have to put certain each culvert's going to have three of them um so it's a it's going to be um, a challenge in the time frame. I had hoped you guys would have talked to Chris two weeks ago when I was in last few meeting. Um, the only savings grace is, is that they bumped this out for two more weeks for a filing deadline. So I've got a month basically to, to do this. And um, I haven't even met with Chris to make sure that we have a plan on how to do it and proportion out who's doing what and what can. Aerial photos. I mean, who's providing what? Yeah, it's. A, it's I'll, I'll, I'll follow the. I, I might have followed the link to you actually, the information, so you can share it with the board. I know you get a million emails. When did you share it? I sent it out the other day um, when I got it. So it would have been just in the last couple of days, probably. Um, so I, I downloaded it, but um, I read through it and it was a little frightening. Uh, in the sense of they, they're really going to want to deep dive on, on this stuff. So, oh, is that the, was that the email that talked about the extension of time? Of 15? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, that's, uh, I've got to <clears throat> verify if that's just specifically for the um, Wilkinson Swamp culvert, because if, if that's Wilkinson Swamp and we can get some real money from that, I would dig in, but I think this is for the other ones. Okay. Um, and Wilkinson Swamp is another one that we should be trying to find out of July 1st, so maybe that's Wilkinson. But those other COVID grant, um, again, I'm going to meet with Chris Fournier. He hasn't told me when on Thursday, but uh, Thursday morning, I'm going to do some on sites. So I'm waiting for an email from him. <coughs> and when we meet, I'll, I'll pose all my questions to him for the competing grants because I'm sure he's. He's been point on this and he's probably got the requirements segregated and I'll get an update. 
that's a side issue. So the, getting back to this is, yeah, I'll, I'm going to start working on trying to uh, incorporate things to the ordinance and the things that are just straight out easy, we'll go with those first. You know, some of the housing standards or adding in some of the RSAs for the health officer uh, that are just state. Uh, I have a question. You oh, touched please. on uh, area for photographs, photography. It would be helpful to be able to have some kind of a Google Earth program. I mean, it could be helpful in a lot of areas around town. Um, that is every uh, year is three to four years old. So the satellites don't swim over here, but it'll be three or four years. Yeah, well, that's Google. There are other branches. I don't know what the cost of those types of. You can go to you can go to Granite, which is the state land use thing, and I think it's your G R A N I T. Um, and I don't remember how much how much they have. I haven't dug into it really deeply. Mostly because most of those programs are PC based and I'm on the map. So unless I really need them, I don't dig that deep in. I did a cohort of mine that I worked with in town who was on the planning board. He was really adept at using granite. He created all sorts of um, things for us on the planning board there by going into, into granite and pulling up maps and layers and all sorts of stuff. There's an amazing, you do amazing stuff where you where you start with the subsurface of the land. I know this isn't health stuff, but you start with the subsurface, the bones of the land, and then you can add the vegetation and add layers up on it. It's um, it's just there are amazing programs out there that are free. Um, uh, I don't know that we would need something that you would have to pay for, um, as you say. Google is I use I use the Google stuff for for the junkyard stuff, but that Google aerial photographs that show all the all the trash and all these are stuff that's been around for years and years. Right, and it depends on you know it does of course depend on on what you're looking for. Whether you're looking for a place that you know has been a junkyard for ten years, and you just want a couple of pictures to to ship off to the attorney, or whether you're looking for your more current stuff, you can. Um, you can fly drones. Um, Matt addressed that in the enforcement workshop. Um, you probably remember that uh, you can uh, you can fly drones, um, but you have to fly them high enough so that they're in public airspace. So the drone use has become much more prevalent for a lot of surveilling, but you have to be careful about the legal issues. I mean, we could fly a drone over you know someone's property. Um, I won't mention anything. Um, and if it was below a certain level, it would be trespassing. But if it was above a certain level, we would be within our rights to do it. So, well, I think yeah, you know, in a case like this, it's just taking pictures to provide for uh, applications for a grant. So, no enforcement or anything. Yeah. Uh, Dave, I think, was going down the road of enforcement. And, uh, yeah, definitely. And, it's, and the faster you grab them, the better. And that's why the need for updated aerial photography or satellite is much more beneficial. Well, it's possible there are pages of pro programs out there that will do it. I have no idea about them. You know. Big municipalities may sign on to an agency that will actually do a flyover for them. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was out there. Hire a drone, as it were, um, as opposed to just the idea that you can fly a drone as long as you keep the label. Well, in, I have to say that in my business, um, there are companies that advertise to us uh, that will come out with drones and do the Every every year they're worth its salt now. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, but uh, drones are uh, um, they're up people's noses. You know, that's not the type of thing you really want us as a town to be doing. You you want something that's you know well. It depends on what you're looking for. Yeah, I guess, you know, we, we'd have to narrow that down in a, in a very pointed discussion to use something like that. Because if we if we can go on a property uh, and, and know that something is what it's meant, 
it is what it is. And, you know, if we, we have a suspicion of that, we can get an administrative warrant and access the property. That's pretty common. The health officer is the one entity that really can say, I believe there's a reasonable uh, belief that there's something on that property and the statutes allow you to access it. Smart money says, don't just go do that. Yeah. You know, get an administrative warrant and notice the owner. Uh, it, depending what's out there, you or your suspicions are, you could just talk to the owner and say, you know, what it is. But again, the concern there is for the owner to say, yeah, come on the property. And then once you're on, say, I never said he could <laughs> come on. And that's all part of that training on know the, the, the best way to operate to do these things. Um, I think if you're 300 feet in the air uh, taking a picture down on something, you, for the health department, we're not going to know what that is because we're going to, is it apples or is it something else? So, uh, well, I, I opened that drum and I was pretty close to it. And I, I was reasonably convinced one of them was one thing and the other was the other. So. Um, so for our uses, I, I think there are mechanisms for us to be able to access the property if we really felt that that was that much of a concern. I would say that just my, my feelings, and I don't know what the board is thinking, but right now we have some issues in town directly related to septic systems not being in existence. And we know we have kind of a transient thing going on it incorporates a lot of these smaller trailers and such that do not have septic systems. We have no mechanism to monitor when people are there, um, how much use it gets, or if it was gonna be uh, pumped out or some, some mechanism for them to dispose of the waste and give us an accurate um, proof of that. One of the things the state does with regulating campgrounds is simply they have a registry. You cannot access the campground, come in, use any of those facilities without logging in. So you know who's there, how long they've stayed, what kind of usage is going on. And the state mandates you must have an on-site septic system that you tie into or that they can dump that material directly into another, you know, I forget what they call it, but they, they can handle the waste there. Or you can have a vehicle come in to pump it out apparently. Um, we don't have a mechanism in place to regulate that. It would be impossible for us to be able to, you know, watch the comings and goings of people around town. And we do have the neighbors in many cases, and not just necessarily an abutting neighbor, complaining about the uses that they see, and they know that there's no septic system. And this is a, a kind of a conflict with our audience. So we're gonna probably have to address, address that before we end today. But that's my, that's my focus is we, we know we have a septic system issue in town. There are rules there that everybody should be playing by. And, uh, you know, if you move into town and your house doesn't have a septic system, I just, quite frankly, I just don't think that's something that, that's acceptable. The state doesn't allow it. And I don't think we should. Where's the waste go? You know, you get money to even know what's happening. <clears throat> We're in conservation groups now. This time. Uh, well, you know, maybe we'll, you know, as we we pick up the mantle on this, we we'll, maybe we'll hear from people. Um, so the ordinance revisions we we went through. Um, so ordinance requirements are what you I wanted to discuss, and that is bringing us right into this sub subject matter now. Um. Dave, do you have a, a copy of the ordinance? Because I do if you don't. Somebody needs one of have copies. So um, section three, which is on your first page, is uh, pretty much the big one for us. You have applicability, boy, I'm having a day. 
um, and that will be something we need to cover. And uh, local re review of applications for approvals for the ISDS, which is something we do now start to monitor. And then alternative disposal systems are going to be something that we should be looking at because of compound posting and incinerator type toilets. Um, so the state is revising some, some um, uh, rules and regulations around those. And um, for uh, construction uh, replacement, there's certain regulations required around that. So, um, the section I really want to look at is probably the very beginning of section three, which is just on page two. This is going to get some revisions as to uh, the language in here, but for the most, it really has stayed current in how it applies to modern day. You know, it was made in 2002, but really what it's looking to protect uh, the community from seems to be relevant, just needs a bit of a facelift. So um, the purpose is a pretty straightforward as well as the authority. And then we get into the applicability. And this is where uh, Rebecca and I have had discussions, Chuck as well, and the town's attorney. And this is where we really need to decide where we're gonna go with this. Um, it says, no person shall construct, erect, place, alter any building, structure, or dwelling from which sewage or, sewage or other waste will be discharged or construct a sewage disposal system within the town of Effingham without proper approval and plan specifications of the sewage or waste disposal system without any waivers of the, app the applicable regulations by the state of New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. So as regarding this, this and discussions with the town's attorney is basically like 147.8 that RSA describes. Everything for human habitation, this applies to including businesses. Uh, so whenever you're having anybody kind of human actions that are going to need a septic system, you can expect gray water or any discharge from would need to um, have a system. Also, uh, we do not allow anything to go on a lot, theoretically, that does not have uh, a water supply for the kind of human habitation, which would be under the next uh, two paragraphs. A dwelling constructed, erected, placed, or altered, not supplied with water, shall have a sewage or waste disposal system approved by the Hampshire DES. Da, da, da. Uh, what that essentially, why that's in there is the state if you do not have a water supply, does it require you to have a septic system? But the state's regulations are at a minimum and they state that everywhere. And, and it's up to the towns to bring it up to a higher standard should we want. What happened here was the recognition of you do not need to have a water supply, but you still need a septic system because ultimately toilets and drains need to be in place and that's in 147.8. So this was, it's kind of a catch 22. You're gonna need water to have a functioning septic system. And that water supply by the state standard could be as simple as having a 250 gallon container up on a hill fed by gravity on a garden hose. If you've got that, then you have a water supply and you're required to have a septic system. So this ordinance was designed to that everybody putting anything for human habitation, uh, temporary or permanent, requires a septic system. And ultimately, you would expect to have uh, a water supply, although we don't state it. So this is an area where I'll probably be dealing with our attorney on occasions, or at least um, with you guys in, in conjunction with to see how we want to phrase or change anything. But the third sentence is a, another telling item that Matt has weighed in on, which is a dwelling shall mean any build, building, structure, trailer, mobile home, manufactured housing or camp or pot thereof used in occupation for human habitation or intended to be used uh, to be so used and includes uh, any appurtenances belonging thereto or usually enjoined, enjoyed with therewith. So again, it's just a flowery way to say that anybody who's using that and you know washing dishes or doing anything else on that property 
uh, in one of those structures and having that structure even being placed on a lot, according to our ordinance, the way it stands now, should have the approved septic system. Uh, I did check with the state of New Hampshire to see, because they've done away with holding tanks, what other options are there for a small unit, like a trailer or whatever? Um, what's the smallest septic system that the state will allow? Are there any kind of special consideration? And I was a little surprised to find out there are none. They still have to meet the minimum standards for a two to four bedroom house for a septic system. Well, that's I that's it. None too. I looked into that. What's that? Nothing. Nothing. What that you can use as opposed oh. to a septic system. So, are system. you telling me that like camps on the lake or whatever have to follow that too? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. camps on the lake, uh, the state started that implementing that in '67. Or, or like a hunter's cabin or something like that. Uh, yes. In our ordinance, if you're going to have anything that human habitation is there, then you're supposed to have that. Now, my, Is it for a specific time? Like if you only come up on weekends well, or is it? Well, here's the thing. It's no. And especially if you're leaving something there, like a cabin or your RV stays in place, I see this, that that requirement should be there. Now, my one caveat, and other towns do this too, uh, Vicky, is, is essentially if you're coming up for seven or 10 days and you leave and your RV leaves, you know, it comes up, you land on the lot and you wave by and you tow it or drive it down the road, nobody's bothering you. That's fine. But if you're leaving that there on the lot, that trailer stays, then a septic system is the way. Uh, this reads, and that's where so I I'm not talking that. about just RVs or campers or whatever. I'm talking about like a hunter cabin that they may go up for a weekend. Right. They have to have a two bedroom. No, no building, no building or dwelling or structure should be placed on a lot without having a septic system. That's what that's saying. Can From I a certain date. No, year round. That's 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 a lot. No, I mean, I mean, like, say that it's fifty years old. It's there. Oh, I see. And they and they come up on weekend, not every weekend, but you know what I mean. Like, are they required to have? Right. Now it's it's. <clears throat> I don't know this in exact terms, and I would have to check with the uh, our attorney or the state to see how how this gets implemented, but. Um, my thought is there's a potential, like you say, for grandfathering a camping cabin That's that didn't true. have anything there. I think it would come down to now if there's a water supply, yes. Once you hook water up there, you definitely have to have that. The other thing is outhouses are something that we no longer uh, allow in Effingham and dealing with the state when you when you're discussing where we are on the aquifer and how much water and brooks and streams are in the town of Effingham. Um, the gentleman at the state said that he thought it would be a bad practice for the town of Effingham in our situation to allow outhouses. Didn't think that was a smart move. Um, so that would be, you would have an outhouse theoretically in your picture of that camping cabin. So if that all pre-existed, I'd say that should be something that should be discussed with the attorney to decide. As the other part of this is there are some things that because of public health, those changes aren't grandfathered. They get incorporated. Is this one of them? I think it is. So um, there again, I would get, rather get a legal opinion on that because some certain things, um, you, you don't get a right to continue a harmful use. Well, you're saying illegal, but what about state? I mean, wouldn't we follow what state is saying is required and not, I mean, well, the state, can a lawyer the go state, above the state yes. of what? Uh, You'll get you, Rebecca. I know you're um, chomping over there. Uh, <laughs> I don't even have to look. I know. Okay. Yeah, because Chuck's telling you, but okay. No, I, yeah. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but the members of the board were, were discussing things. So right. I go to board members first, typically. Um, 
So yes, uh, the state in every communication you get on like a septic system, the back page, what you'll find in the fine print is always the statement and they do it in a lot of things. Um, the, this approval for operation does not see, supersede any equivalent or more stringent local ordinance or, or regulation. State standards are minimum and must be met statewide. So what they're saying is they have a baseline, a very minimal position on this, and every town can regulate up from that in this particular case. So now it's to the towns to decide what do you want to allow? And if you have a harmful use or potentially harmful use in your, your health ordinance, you can mitigate that. Now, to whether or not how far back in time you can go to say that camping cabin now has to have something, um, I would say chances are it, would, it has a good chance of being grandfathered the way it is with an existing outhouse. Um, where you run into problems is the usage. More usage, somebody going there and it's not being used for hunting cabin once a year or something. And people are now staying there with some frequency. You might want to say, well, that is not what this was intended for. So there's a there's a fine line. I was gonna say that fine line is up to the health officers. It's it's up to the health officer to write the ordinance. Uh, I would need you guys, I would assume, to uh, support it, the ordinance, make it, you know, because we'd all take part in it and approve it. So there's certain things that the ordinance states now, and the legal opinion from our attorney, and Chuck was there for, the ordinance says what the ordinance says, and every, the court puts meaning to every word. So you have rules on the books here now that are quite you know, specific and that encompasses a whole nother legal concern that I'll address later. But um, we do have things in, 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 to a certain point to deal with those camp cabins supposedly is how it started. Um, now, when you adopt that use and you're coming in, you're using that more, you go for, to a full-time residence from a seasonal residence, you're supposed to upgrade your systems. There are requirements in, on the books. So you can't, there's a point where the use changes. And when that use evolves, or you, you now have more leverage for the town to say you need to change with the times and with, you know, the, it's for the benefit of the town, health of the town. But um, again, I can't specifically answer that question directly with those old timey hunting cabins that were around before zoning came in and all that. I would rather get, I'd rather get an opinion on that. And certainly uh, it comes into another consideration of law where there's a thing in, in the law that's quoted in a bunch of courts. And then I, I know Rebecca wants to speak, so I, I want to get to her. Um, it's essentially that there's no immunity from a plan, from a failure to uh, implement the plan that's in place. I've got the document here somewhere. You have an ordinance in place and um, it outlines what's supposed to happen. And if we don't do what we say we're supposed to do and the plans and intentions are of the board, you get a certain liability. There's, for example, a police department decided they were gonna stop you know, being out there for the kiddies at the school crosswalks and they showed up for a few weeks and then for some reason they came away, but they had a plan. It was a publicized plan, boom, we're gonna be there. Then mom sends one of her daughter over, daughter goes to the crosswalk. That day, the, cro the, the crossing guard, the police officer is not there. She walks out and gets hit by a car. They found the municipality because of the police department was, was liable. It was your fault, basically. It's a stretch to me, but that's what was decided. We clearly have a plan on the books. We have strayed from that. And if there was a detriment to the community or somebody in the community, there's a potential. Can I tell you how that would work? Again, that's your lawyer to tell you, you know, what, we, what our jeopardy is. Um, 
So if that answers things in the short term, I was going to let Rebecca chime in because I know she wants to address it. Well, and also, I really, I need to go back and work. Oh, sure. Get back to my desk. Um, answering your question about the camp, we, we do have grandfathered ones, but we also have ones that have come through since I've been a zoning officer. Um, and it's not addressed specifically in the health ordinance, so I have followed the guidelines of the state, which if someone has a seasonal camp um, and they get a state approved system, which may include a gray water system and a chemical toilet or a gray water system and a composting toilet, toilet, we have accepted that as a state approved system that allows them to go forward with their camp. Um, and that has happened you know, a couple of times since I've been the since I've been the zoning officer. Um, that they they have provided essentially state approval for an alternative system, alternative to an in-ground installed system for a camp that is not fully fledged out. Rainwater for the washing of dishes and a composting or, or a chemical toilet, not approved, but but within the structure. Okay. Um, so that's that's an answer to that question. I tend to agree with Mike in terms of of grandfathering um, that that provided you cannot find that there is a specific health issue with a camp that operates with a privy that pre-exists zoning, then I would certainly say that that is a grandfathered use. If 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 it was built on a riverbank and they were crapping into the river, then obviously there would be a, a health issue concern. But if they're off in the middle of their 40 acres with a camp with a privy that's been there for the last 40 years, then I don't see it either as a zone violation or a health issue. And, and there again, the, the, the privy is pre-existing because we no longer allow right, those right. outcomes. Yes. And as, as we do not allow as we do not, not allow porta potties unless they're directly related or connected with an event or construction or you know um, like your contractors building your house and puts in a porta potty. We don't allow porta potties as an alternative approach to waste disposal in the town, and I can had to call people out on that. And, and um, since you're touching on that, I just want to clarify that the porta potties should be uh, approved. To, it used to be the board of selectmen. But since you have a health officer, it's for the health officer who just used to be part of the board, so it was kind of all one. But I need to approve those. So, for example, if there's going to be a porta potty in town, um, you can't just land one. Or if you have a failed septic system, there's provisions that we give you 90 days while your system is being repaired, and then there's a 30 day, you know, extension beyond that. And you run about six months, in which case you say, you know. You're gonna probably have to vacate the house or get a septic system. Okay, so I, oh. sorry, that's not correct. You actually, until you rewrite the fourth health ordinance, it specifically says that the permit for a porta potty comes from the board of selectmen. Right, it does do that, and that's that is a, a clarification that I figured that would go to the the health officer because we do have a board of health, and the board of we can change that to the board of health. Oh, or, so right now it stands. It's the it's the board of selectmen that right. makes right the now, decision. The selectmen not the health office. No, it's not the health officer. It does say yes. board of selectmen. Oh, I, could, I I thought I heard you say that. It, it was right. It would have officer. been with the board because of the health officer being on the board. It was a collective of the position would float around as a selectman. Um, that would be something that probably would be changed to the health officer, if you're going to have a health officer, unless you guys are going to start going out and doing the on-site stuff for septic systems and approving the porta potty that would go hand in hand with the septic system, because you, you're not getting a porta potty unless it's an event day or it's a failed septic system being repaired or replaced. Or the other thing would be um, when now by building code, the codes are if you're going to have contractors on the, you know building you a house by code you're supposed to have a porta potty which I don't think is contestable I wouldn't think anybody the board or, or myself would have a problem having the workman's thing out there but a family living out of a porta potty is not all right I, I I was wondering if I misunderstood you because no, no. I thought you when I you, did say if no if you said if you were going to have an event. You have to have a permit to put a porta potty on 
the premises for that event. Right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you would need an approval. I'm not sure it's the exact language now that we're saying it here for real time. Um, I think we've you would need the the approved. Need to be approved. I don't know what the process is. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, saying someone's having a a wedding right. for a weekend. Right. At at the at a at some land they have no no cabin anything right. just on some land they have right you're saying you they have to get a permit to put that there for a day or two oh, it's in three o three and it's to obtain a permit from the board of selectmen for a temporary use of a portable toilet when a system is in failure on written information shall provide you know, but that is that for a specific time right, right. Um, it's in here though I'm sorry <laughs> very bottom. Very bottom, thanks. And there it is. Um, yeah, portable toilets when used temporarily for special events or functions or temporarily at a construction site and when they do not constitute a nuisance are not affected by this ordinance. So apparently you wouldn't. So we wouldn't. We wouldn't so you wouldn't need one. Okay. No. It's not saying for uh, Maybe um, if it's a public event, we do have an event, we do have an event ordinance right. that, that is signed off on by the board of selectmen. And there may be something in that. Well, well, that yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a little different, different from what I. Hundred people, you know, are going to do Woodstock. Well, over here. right. It wouldn't be anything, you know, the okay. idea of having somebody say that they're going to bring a unit into town for an event, and getting an approval wouldn't probably necessarily be the worst thing. Mm -hmm. Something to consider now that it's come up in discussion, and that approval doesn't have to be by fee or. Even in in paper, it might be just simply an acknowledgement to call it and just uh, have a contact saying you're doing it. Um, my point here would be your event is over. Whoever was responsible for removing the porta potty didn't do it. It's been there for thirty days or something. Is that an issue or not? I don't know. So something to, to think about. But no, you're you're right. It wouldn't be. And if okay. I read this recently, uh, preparing for this meeting, I would have. Then more succinct than Gentlemen, I have a question about a failed I, system. I'm, I'm, I, I know you need to continue. Yes. Know I've got work to do before my office hours. Um, and I also have a meeting with you, gentlemen, gentlemen, the lady, and the lady <laughs> listening to the hearings. Um, is there anything further that you would like to ask me of while I'm here? Um, or I'll go back to my warrant. Um, not at the moment. I imagine if there's any questions that come up as part of all the discussions okay. that would involve you, which would be if we get into the RVs and where to go, which to certainly. What would you like, Mike? What would you like copies of as I issue permits? I know that I gave you the, uh, it just crossed my mind after I did the, the monthly report that you had asked for the, a copy of the final permit after issue. Right. Um, of, and they only did one, one IDES permit last month and you have been given a copy of the application form to see it you want me to dump back in your mailbox a copy of the, the complete package yeah if it's signed off so that we we can do as we put files together we'll know you that more hard copies of all that or do you want me to email you stuff you can just email it and i can okay. print them out as necessary okay and the same with the rv permits yeah, the RV permits is the other thing I'd like to look at because that's the, the thing that we may be look, you know, looking at. Right. And, and at the moment, we're operating on the assumption that the language in the ordinance that says um, discharge, um, since RVs do not discharge, they are self-contained, um, it doesn't apply to it. No, so no, no, but I'm not going to fight with you on that. We've already had the, the attorney's way on. Wait in, Rebecca. Yeah. I appreciate it. He has your... not weighed in on that paragraph. Uh, I beg your pardon. He weighed in on the language of structures. He did not weigh in on the definition of discharge. So at the moment, I will I, I, I know you want to split hairs on that, and we can get back to that. You fall in the state law. If you've got water, you need to have a system. Discharge isn't even mentioned in that particular item. These are RVs that are self-contained. Huh? Okay. But if they've got water, you know, I don't Very know anybody that doesn't come up for a weekend in an RV so. and bring five gallons of water with them. That's water so. in the facility. So right now, um, for um, my position, I'm, I'm going to I disagree with position. you. I know your position. And I have the, the attorney's position that when you put out something, he didn't see it eye to eye with you and he was supporting my position. So I'm going to give that to the board to chew on and if there's more legal 
questions on this, certainly bring them forward, but I, we won't be able to answer them here without having the attorney weigh in further on an issue you feel he hasn't covered. So yeah, I, I did the cover the second paragraph, but not the first paragraph. So that's, in fact, we had this discussion just parenthetically so that everyone understands. We had this discussion at the planning board meeting when we were discussing all of this. And it the was- planning board is not germane to the health ordinance. The, the, when you rewrite the zoning ordinance, it doesn't change laws or other ordinance. It becomes subordinate to whatever other law or ordinance is in place. The more restrictive applies. The health ordinance does not get overwritten by a zoning ordinance. That wasn't what I was about to say, but I'll let you believe it was. Um, I'll see you folks at whatever time you call me. If you finish your meeting before six and I'm still in office hours, I'll just put my phone in my pocket and come over. Just let me know. So Sounds good. Go yep. back and bag on the door. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, Dave, you I had one other thing I wanted to ask. Um, in my reading with the state stuff, as far as a system needing repair an unusable system a tank 2000 gallon or larger may is permitted to be put in the ground temporarily and i believe there's like a one year or six month term for that as well and as far as i could find there is no other approved thing for a system that's failed. I don't think the state allows you to put a porta potty there and call it. No, it, right. They, they don't they don't say it's fixed and neither does is that what this is implying. What it is saying here is if you've got a system in failure that needs to be replaced, you can use a porta potty given our ordinance here so that you have a place to actually relieve yourself. Well, that but was my well, question. Well, it's like being said, our, our ordinance cannot, by definition, be less strict than the state. If it is an ordinance and it is less strict, then it is null and void automatically. The state one takes precedence. So I will write down that question concern to uh well, if the state saying, has a minimum since the state would allow you to use a tank but not but not portable well that's probably you know your system is failing right right now if you can't flush your toilet you don't really know what the problem is so now you gotta get somebody out there to inspect it that guy can't come for two weeks like everybody's busy this allows you to put a porta potty and use that while they find out what's wrong with the system and then dig it up and replace it. Well, and and, and that, right, again, we're splitting hairs though, Lenny, because basically, if you're a responsible person, then yeah, that'd probably take about a week or two to get the guy in there to fix, your, fix the clog or whatever it is. But we don't have a lot of responsible people out there at times and so i don't know yeah well most of the time your system fails it fails in the winter so um, <laughs> so trying to get a contractor there and do it in the winter well i, I think three. there are several things like where you're going with this i think the kind of the you know the two thousand gallon tank being installed or whatever that's not going to happen overnight and uh rigging it to the house or having a designer, you know, come out and design your new system. I think this is like a stopgap to provide relief to the property owner in the middle of what we would all probably consider a crisis. Then if you're, your written. shower's backing up with every time you flush the toilet. And then it should be written as a stopgap. Well, a reference put in. This is a temporary thing until this can come up. But well, it, we can always turn around and, and update this. Yeah. But right now, well, this is the bar of the land. Kind of well, says, it's 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 like there is, yeah, there is no way out of this point because this is what we have in place. And it does say, you know, temporary use of a portable toilet when a system is in failure, following written information shall be provided. So uh, the following written information would come through, uh, and certainly that would allow whomever's doing this job, our job to kind of stay on top of this because it has the, the name of the designer 
um, nature of failure. So, you know, you could follow up as a timeline as to what are you doing to correct it. Well, I would think that part of that written information would have to be that you've got somebody, you have a plan that's approved by the state, and you're going to fix the system. Well, properly, right? Well, before you can even submit an application to the state, you're going to probably need to go to the bathroom. So we're just saying, I well, I, I, you know, days, I'm, so. I'm the last guy to stop somebody from using a porta potty for a temporary use. I think they're a great way of it's well, not for sure. and, and if it needs to be more definitive on the, the steps to be followed or some timelines, we can certainly hash that out. It does give 90 days, um, you know. It, temporary permit will be issued in writing by the board and shall be valid for 90 days, da, 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 maybe renewed 30 day increments. So my biggest takeaway from that is really not what it says here in applying it. it it's the, where's the temporary permit template? Because we don't have one and we'd have to issue one at any given moment. So. Yeah. And there would be the <laughs> solve. Well, that would solve the issue right there because a temporary permit can be given for a certain amount of days. Right, right. And, you know, coming up with those templates and, and that would allow us to stay on top of it. One of the things I had a little problem with what Rebecca was saying about issuing um, these permits for a cabin or anything else, because they have these alternative systems of composting toilets or incinerator toilets and such. Um, at this point in time, I find that problematic because in my discussions with the state, and the environmental codes, environmental code 800, I'm not sure if which it's under residuals um, and 1600. They don't really have a provision for those things. They do not sanction those mm -hmm. things. And it would be up to the town to adopt any rules for that. But talking to Anthony Druin, who's the um, residuals manager, he's involved with putting new language together to uh because more people are trying to deal with alternative stuff you know save the planet and all like that the state's working on provisions to say you can have certain things but they will need to be regulated right now the only regulations that exist are as if you were at, at a facility say if you were taking human waste at the transfer stations so there's a lot of regulations to that um a young lady in town said she has composting toilets well, where does that compost go? How is it handled? There's a lot of rules concerning that. And the state does not see this in my conversation as a proper usage. And if we were going to have something like that, since the state regulates this stuff, we may have to regulate it as well. And therefore we'd have to get an education on what we're regulating and why. So to just say, what I heard a moment ago, I, I, I can't go along with that from the little bit I've been told because it's, it doesn't seem to be 100% legal at this point. And I don't think circumventing RSA 147.8 is, is uh, I, I, that's basically what you're doing with what I heard because you're not self-contained. You build a facility out here or bring in a trailer and you can stay there from our permitting standpoint of 150 days. There's no holding tank that's going to hold legally 150 days or 50 days or probably more than two weeks at the best. Um, There's uh, another way to do that, to handle that. Uh, we okay. Find out how big the, have it right on the questionnaire for the permit. How big is your holding tank in the system? It's adequate to take four days or five days to make the permit out in four to five days. If it's bigger, fine. Well, Some are a, bit, a little bit bigger, but that's all you get. I, I, again, it, you have no way to regulate that because right. we you don't know how there. much they have in there before they even come to that site either. Right. There's just there's <laughs> no possible way. And we hashed this out, Chuck and I, uh, with the attorney, and, and, and Rebecca was on the call. She can't be writing permits for every four and five days all week long as people transient, like coming from Massachusetts or out. And there's no way the health department can stay up with it. And there's no way you're going to make the neighbors happy when they say, I don't care what you say, and the five gallon bucket, bucket goes up over that hill and it comes back. And I, I've got nothing to offer to, to protect the community from this kind of aid. And, I, and I've been told by credible individuals, like one person from the state just this past week that 
they know it's happening. They, they, they talk to people, it is happening. You've seen it. So how you fix that, I don't know. But any, any solution, I certainly want it to be in line with the, the state. And if the state's saying, well, that's great, you're using XYZ toilet, but we don't approve those. It, it is not an approved system. Or it's approved for a certain function, but now maybe uh, in the way our permits are being written, somebody's taking huge liberties with the idea of what that the capacity and that use is. And that's not what the state of New Hampshire is on board with or is intending. Because I don't think that anybody at the state that I've talked to would say that, yeah, you can live in an RV for two or three months. And we have no expectation that that holding tank needs to have any kind of servicing or, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, math is math. And you, you got a five gallon bucket and only so much will go in it. And then it runs over. Um, I've never seen uh, a disposal truck for residents, you know, for these RVs. I've never noticed one in town. I've never noticed one coming off a property with an RV. I mean, maybe others have, but I never have. So, um, okay, so trying to move on with those things, but those are kind of the, the, the biggest areas where I see um, need for a lot of changes in the existing septic systems outside of some scrivener stuff and just up updating terminology. Um, 306 is part of what you were touching on earlier uh, with the uh, requirements for expansion of existing uses, uh, including con conversions from seasonal use. And the state does have some language for this kind of thing. So I'll try to find those RSAs that uh, encompass it. But it goes to the whole idea, I believe, that you know, when you're, you're going to a year-round residence, there's no escaping that you're going to need a septic system. And I'm pretty sure that the state has language for that. So considering that everybody's going to read this with a, a different eye than I have, um, take these, mark them up, put some thoughts in there maybe some suggestions on you know ways to go or acknowledging that maybe something does need uh, a change or some of our attention and you may not have the answer to that but you know just say this seems like there's something not 100 percent on that item and that would be useful and important to get back so that when we put something together uh, deal with it um Early on, I did have a list going on properties just on one day. I went out and looked at uh, some of these were brought to my attention, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 properties came up and I haven't even pulled records or really went out, I didn't drive the whole town. So their concerns and most of them are have RVs on them and we're permitting them and I just don't think that the permit is taking in consideration of the zoning ordinance. I can give you Matt's opinion, which Chuck, this looks to be, it was, a, I sent out something because of a conversation Rebecca had with the planning board when certain changes were being made to the RV uh, part of the ordinance. I didn't know it was taking place. I just happened to come in one evening and uh, nobody had consulted me because nobody's really recognized the, the health ordinance in so many years. So um, with, by the time they met again, I had sent out an email to Matt asking if he had an opportunity, which is the bottom email, to review uh, the ordinance and um, how what I thought of uh, how it applied to that RSA I keep mentioning, 147.8. And up above, you'll see Matt's response to that.
So there, there are some other emails, um, which I think I might have forwarded to uh, Chuck so that he can um, share them with the board. Or Chuck had already had them, and I maybe I was condensing them in one slot for you so you wouldn't lose your mind trying to find them. Um, and it goes back to probably the discussions that Rebecca was having with the planning board prior to putting amendments out for the zoning ordinance and some positions that she held. And from there, some interactions with the town's attorney on some of these things. And one of them will tell you that um, in a rebuttal Rebecca sent, um, Matt disagreed with her interpretation, but uh, you should read those for yourselves. I didn't bring enough copies on that. I won't forward those. No, no. Hmm? I won't forward. I won't find them in my files to forward. You know. And um, at the conclusion of a phone conversation, I'm going to say somewhere in a, maybe in February uh, of last this, this year, not this year. Um, Rebecca did at the conclusion of that conversation send out a kind of a rebuttal on the con the entire conversation we had with uh, Matt as to how she would like to proceed with um, dealing with RVs. So you guys can print that one out if you like here before you leave. Um, nobody responded to that, but I would say my view of it is at the time this was not where selectman then chairman fuller was and it wasn't where i was at and i don't believe it's where our town's attorney was at as far as her two scenarios of, of remedy i do think there would have to be some type of remedy if we're going to start telling people that you need a septic system for your rv and that having reasonable expectations, timelines, and so forth to deal with it um, would, would be something we should do. Um, but we do have people living in RVs year round. We do have people making extensive use of these properties uh, without septic systems. We know there are abuses. The only way that I have been able to come up with uh, to make sure that we do our best to see that the abuses stop and the environment and such is protected in the basic health of the community is by having a septic system. Because if you have a septic system, we're pretty comfortable we know where the waste is going. You, you can pretty much be assured that you got it, you, you paid the money for a septic system, you're tied into it. We don't have the problems, unlikely to have the problems that we know are taking place. Um, the other thing is I've been contacted by a number of people that are butters by the proxy of their, like for notification, if you're butting up against the property, you'd be in a butter, but that's only for notification purposes when the hearings for zoning boards and so forth, planning boards, you, you don't have to be in a, an absolute of butter on the property line to be in a butter to be affected by things. So that's something to keep in mind that there's a greater population out there that have or would have a say in what's going on uh, in their neighborhood or you know down the stream, whatever. It's it, legally, I, I think it's a broader group of people than a very finite, narrow one. The other thing I wrestle with, and I just want to bring it to this board's attention, um, is. It's a part of the criminal code and it's official oppression. It's RSA section 643 colon one. And it goes on to state a public service, a, a servant defined in the RSAs is guilty of a misdemeanor if with a purpose, purpose of benefit himself or another or to harm another, he knowingly commits an unauthorized act which purports to be an act of his office. Or, and this is the part that really is what I think is more of a concern, knowingly refrains from performing a duty imposed on him by law or clearly inherent in the nature of the office. So to me, issuing permits potentially that you're in conflict with another uh, RSA or ordinance in the town, I should say, 
I'm not sure if that opens the door. I think that that would be a question for the attorney. Um, when determining in RSA 67614, determination of which local ordinance takes precedence, whenever a local ordinance, whenever a local land use ordinance is enacted or regulation is adopted, which, which differs from the authority of an existing ordinance or other regulation, the provision with, which imposes the greater restriction or higher standard should be controlling. And that's what I alluded to earlier. When you have a health ordinance that's saying one thing and you're doing something else and saying it's permitted because of our zoning, that would be incorrect. It's an incorrect interpretation. Um, there's one more ordinance in here and uh, that goes to the filing of who could file a violation. And that pretty much is um, anyone um, can file for injunctive relief, 67615, or maybe not anyone, but um, in case uh, any building or structure or part thereof is proposed to be erected, constructed, altered, reconstructed, reconstructed, or any land is or proposed to be used in violation with this title of any local ordinance code or regulation adopted under this title or any provision or specification of an application plat or plan approved by or any uh, authority of this title, the building inspector or other official with any authority to enforce the provision of this title or any local ordinance code or regulation adopted under this, oh, did I skip? Yep. Or any owner of any adjacent or neighboring property who would be specifically damaged by such a violation in addition to other remedies provided by law, in, institute an injunction, mandamus, abatement, or any other appropriate action or proceed, proceeding to prevent, enjoin, abate, or remove such unlawful erection, construction, alteration, or reconstruction. So I'm not an attorney, but I, I do read this to mean that there might be some jeopardy here. Um, and in issuing permits, that's one of the things that's covered in implementing and enforcing state building codes and state fire codes. And it talks specifically to um, building inspectors uh, no building permit shall be denied on the grounds of uncomplete streets. Oops, wait a minute. Uh, the wrong one. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. Uh, what standards must building inspector follow when issuing a building permit? The building inspector shall not issue any permit or occupancy permit for any proposed construction, modeling, or maintenance which we will not comply with any or all zoning ordinance, building codes, state building, or fire codes, or planning board regulations which are in effect. It would be a misdemeanor under RSA. 643 colon one, that's the criminal code. If a building inspector knowingly commits an unauthorized act, which, which purports to be an act of his or her office, or knowingly refrains from performing a duty imposed on him by a law clearly inherent of the nature of his office. I'm thinking that there's a liability that the town is taking on right now by one, not enforcing the health ordinance, and by two, not complying with it when we're issuing permits. Anybody in the neighborhood potentially could file a violation, excuse me, a violation of law. And that, um, whether it's against me for not doing my job, whether it's against the board for not <laughs> having me do my job or uh, against the zoning officer for issuing permits, they feel in conflict. I mean, I don't know where the ball stops. It seems like there's a bouncing ball and again, I'm, I'm not the one to answer that, um, but it is a question that might need answering. Um, the other thing is uh, the issuing of building um, RV permits, 120 days out from town meeting, whenever you put in a proposed warrant article change, the new rules apply. So um, I don't know why we're issuing permits in November, December, January, February for an April start date, but that seemed to be part of what I saw in these reports. And I don't really like the idea that we're putting out flyers to the town that basically is describing that they can um, have alternate ways of disposing waste. Uh, it really is not my opinion that that's the case. I, I think
think it's clear. I think our attorney feels it's clear. There's only one way to be on the property and properly dispose of waste, and that's with a septic system. So for my part, I, I think that's pretty much what I'm going to leave you with to wrestle with and consider um, as to how all of this affects all of us, uh, Rebecca and myself, you folks, and what are the needs of the health department? And if we do make changes uh, as quickly as possible to put something together on the health ordinance, um, to know that you will hopefully be able to support some things that we add. So we'll get you that. I'd like to know that I, should we try to make some prudent changes here? I or? think I need to check with Audrey, but I think she took that PDF document from 2002 and, and actually entered yes. it in a Word doc. Right, so it can be manipulated. Yeah. I would think anything that Drafts. you would add to it from, let's say, language of other towns, like off of clarity, whatever, or even new sections, do it under track changes. Yeah. So that way we've got one document that tracks everything regarding the input of that document for the time it's right. So let me let me rephrase that. I wasn't looking for you to like arbitrarily approve anything. I, I'm just saying I can put a bunch of things that I think should be included and some thoughts and ideas in. And you know, everybody will all weigh in on you know what to throw out, what to change, what to keep, what have you. Um, do you want us to take that on? Um, and that's what I'm asking, not like, here, we'll just give you what we want and be done with it. Just yeah, because you get the new laws, and I mean, a lot of the state laws have changed since 2002. Yeah, RSAs. So, yeah. I mean, those, that's going to be incorporated into the new one. Right. So, you're up on that. You know, we don't, we're not. So, but, well, that's the thing. I just want you guys to tell me and Dave, you know, go forward and try to, yeah. you know, bring us up to date. And then you guys can you take a hatchet to what you don't like. You need to get a draft. Okay. And uh, so from that standpoint, it'll be probably a long process. So we'll probably put some things together and where we stop, we can send that out so that you can keep pace. And I know Vicky loves it when I come in and go, here's, here, oh no, that pile's not, you know, there's more. <laughs> Moving in for the weekend. Right? <laughs> she likes these three hour meetings. I know. Yeah. I know. But are uh, you all right with that too, Nikki? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, then. Um, is it is there going to be like a, like we did the work session every time we change something, we did the print in a different color? Yes. So we yeah. knew that's, what that's was. Changes, okay. That's why I just all right. asked that. Okay. Because okay. I didn't know what that meant. Rather than having two or three different documents. Right. It's like, all right, read yeah. this while I read this and try to figure out which one was changed. Okay. When, you, when you've actually updated the document, with additional information in the draft format, save it as a new file name right. with the date right. in the file name sure. of that particular version. You don't like hunting through for the same 16 different versions with the same title? Um, but I mean, if you get like article three and four, you know, send that on. Right. You know, and then you can do, the, you know, a couple more air leisure and that stuff. Because this is, like I said, it, it's it's not something that's going to be really fast and easy to do. There's research, and then you try to make something fit the community you live in. You're not going to have the rules for right. Rochester and apply exactly. them heavy, and that's insane. Exactly. So, <laughs> <Not you. laughs> so uh, okay. Um, then, great, since you guys, you know, uh, you're turning us loose, we'll try to do that. And just... So your eyes won't glaze over. Um, a lot of what is in here is the RSAs in full that I would be using to work with Dave to get things in, as well as part of the environmental codes because the RSAs are only part of it. There's a whole nother giant section of environmental regulations, which if you really can't sleep at night, you gotta start looking at these because they are brutal. At least the RSA says something, you can go, oh, it makes sense. And then you'd be late for work the next day. <laughs> That's why we're all retired here to do this kind of stuff. No sane person that needs to go make a living uh, has the time for this. But, 
So thank you. Uh, I'm sorry it took so long to get it together and it was such a huge dump. There wasn't a ton of back and forth interaction on what's here, but you've got the agenda, so you hopefully you, yeah. you've got things to consider. Um, and uh, again, I think Chuck's had some exposure with the town's attorney. And if you needed to follow up as he shares information with you to help you understand where maybe we should or shouldn't go, um, you guys can work on that uh, as board of selectmen and provide any input to us before we go too far down the rabbit hole you know, if you have some issues you want clarified or things you support or don't support that are, you know, part of the conversations we've had prior. Uh, and with that, if there's any other questions for Dave and I before we, you know, play in the road. No, thanks for doing what you've done. No problem. Motion to adjourn the board meeting. I'll entertain I'll motion. second it. We got a second. <laughs> no. All those in favor. All right. Okay. In an hour. Oh. Mickey, those copies I gave you. Mike. Yeah. Let me, I'll take my dog. At some point, she's. <laughs>